Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is the, the, the last of three interviews, three discussions around events during the period of 1920, 21 and 22. They are organised by the Belfast Commemoration Centenary Committee and they look at events around particularly Belfast but the wider field and the first one of course if you've joined us then was, for, was dealing with the pogroms from 21 and 22. The second one dealt with the state of Republican forces, Repu what were Republicans doing at that particular time. And the third one, uh, I'm delighted to say my guest is Eamon Phoenix, who is a historian, a lecturer, an author, a broadcaster. I think that'll do us for now, Eamon. Um, I, I, what we're really trying to get is a sense of how did the Belfast population react to what appears to be a horrific period of yeah. history? I suppose it's a rare example of a revolution and massive violence going on in a city with a population of, perhaps in those days, you know, 400,000 people. I mean, Belfast was a big city, a big Victorian shock city. It was also a very Protestant city. The Catholic population was only a quarter, 25%, and it stabilised in the 1860s. People came in on all sides from the countryside to find work in the mills and engineering works, the shipyards. And so by 19, 12, 1911 census, really, the nationalist population is living in West Belfast, in Ardoin, in the markets, in Ballymacarrot, you know, in a series of kind of areas that are particularly nationalist, but they are very much a minority in the city. And that's a factor because they are a majority of the casualties. 58% of those killed between 1920 and 1922, and there are about 450 people who are die, die violently in Belfast, come from a Catholic nationalist background. For ordinary people, I mean, I remember talking to people in my own family, people in lecture groups 40 years ago, who had experienced that whole period. I remember one of the key things was life went on. I remember me talking about the horrors of the McMahon murders and all of that. And an old boy at the back said, yes, but life went on. And I realised what he meant when I met my friend Jimmy Kelly, who was the doyen of Belfast journalist. And as a teenager, he remembered the tram conductor going up at the interface of the falls in the Shankill was suddenly shot everybody down and straw was provided on the floor. People would fling themselves on this as gunfire infiladed the trams because of course people were identified by the areas the trams were going to, the falls, the Shankill. Um, there would be sectarian attacks. People were asked the religion on trams and shot dead by fleeing gunmen. Shipyard trams were attacked by the IRA in retaliation for violence against Catholics. So it's her a, a horrendous period and one of the key things is the vast majority of those killed were ordinary innocent civilians it strikes me even comparing it with the recent troubles we lived through yeah. the kind of focusing on women and children in that period some of the violence in Derry in the summer of 1920 where there's almost a sectarian civil war and then Belfast from the expulsion of the Catholics in the shipyards onwards for really over two years is massive it's intense it's um, during the day, it's nocturnal. I mean, just to give you an example, um, in rioting in Royal Avenue in August 1920, as the violence really takes off, something like 10 people are killed at the bottom of Frederick Street, quite close to St Anne's Cathedral, as, you know, shipyard workers leave their trams, local nationalists become involved, an armoured car is sent from Victoria Barracks, mm -hmm. a quarter of a mile away, and it turns its turrets and begins to fire into the crowd. Lots of young men, 16, 17 years of age, doing apprenticeships, are killed that morning between the hours of 9 and 10.30 on a summer's morning. So that gives us a sense. Then when we get into the black days of 1922, we're talking about vicious sectarian killings. The McMahon family murders, of course, became an international kind of atrocity. Uh, at the time. Uh, there was the Protestant Donnelly family who were bombed in Millfield, children killed. Um, uh, there was a Unionist MP shot dead in uh, Garfield Street, just off uh, Royal Avenue. Um, so you have all of that spiralling on. And it's not really until the Irish Civil War breaks out in uh, June 1922 that the violence subsides and eventually comes to an end. That chaos that you described very well, uh, was it as sporadic? Was it? Was there a political direction to it? Was it guided by anyone? And I, I mean, I mean that conflict in general, not from anyone. Well, of, of course, Belfast and indeed the north of Ireland had been on the brink 
1914, on the very eve of the First World War. We had the uh, Home Rule crisis, uh, no compromise in sight. The King called a conference at Buckingham Palace, Redmond and Carson, and they talked about carving up Ulster into different zones. Some would be under Home Rule, some would be under direct rule from London. Nobody was talking about a unionist parliament in Belfast until 1920. Um, and I mean, it looked as though the two armed forces of the day, the UVF and the Irish Volunteers, would come to daggers drawn. It never actually happened because the Great War supervened yeah. and Redmond and Carson supported the war effort. But when those men returned from the Western Front, whether they be nationalists from the Falls in the Connacht Rangers or unionists from the Shankill in the Royal Irish, uh, rifles of the Royal Irish Fusiliers, Ireland is once more on the brink because if they are coming back in the middle end of 1919, they don't find homes fit for heroes. Um, the full employment of the war is now in decline and Ireland is in the grip of the war of independence. So you have IRA violence spreading, the black and tans will soon arrive, the Ulster specials will soon be formed. So really we're into a situation, you could say that uh, the, the sort of potentiality of civil war had been hanging fire during those four years of the Great War. And suddenly it's reignited mm. by the, think about it, the uncertainty about Ireland's future. Um, Doyle Ireland has declared a republic. The IRA are seen uh, by Republicans and by a lot of the population as the armed wing of a democratically elected government whose republic has been denied by the British government. Um, and then you have, of course, unionism in the north who had been fighting for the exclusion of a homeland from a home rule, were still for them independence. James Craig, from the early years of the century, wanted a separate homeland in northeast Ulster, which would encompass most of the Protestant population. So he's thinking in terms of a kind of a six county entity yeah. from about 1912. So all of those things come alive. There's fear on both sides nationalist fear partition, unionist fear inclusion in a nationalist majority republic. That point that you make that fear gripped everyone almost. Mm. That, I mean, we talk about the, the most horrific of the kilns, and you mentioned the McMartins, of course. But fear stalked every community, I suppose. Can I ask you, in terms of <coughs> how authorities looked at it, I mean, was there, was there a blind eye by the Unionist uh, leadership to the pogroms, to the sectarian kilns, or, or was there genuine efforts to control the more uncontrollable elements? The high politics <coughs> were important here. The Lord George coalition was conservative dominated. Lord George was a prime minister without a party. Liberalism had split during the war. He and his liberal supporters were in power on the sufferance of the Tories who could have formed a government themselves. And going back to 1886, there was this alliance, this unbreakable alliance between Ulster Unionism and the Conservative Party, focused on the catch cries of Protestants in danger and the Empire in danger. So. Craig and Carson knew by that stage, and Craig was beginning to overtake Carson, uh, who was about to retire in the political stakes. Uh, they knew that they had the support of Bono Law and the Conservatives, yeah. as they had during the Ulster Crisis. Lloyd George is walking uh, really a tightrope between keeping the Tories on board for an Irish settlement and, of course, dealing with the IRA campaign, which is becoming more and more intense right across the island of Ireland. So that's what's happening in the background. Dublin Castle is a very unionist place from 1918. I mean, so many of the Ulster unionists become junior ministers. The Attorney General for Ireland, Dennis Henry, is a unionist. Um, Sir James Craig was Parliamentary Secretary of the Admiralty. He's a unionist. Um, the officials in Dublin Castle are overwhelmingly pro-Ulster and pro-imperialist. So that's the background at the time. The RIC is a mainly Catholic force, as far as the rank and file it comes under massive pressure from the IRA campaign and boycotting by the civilian population. In Belfast, unionism doesn't trust the RIC. Yeah. And there are too many senior officers and ordinary sort of policemen on the beat who they believe are in sympathy with the aspirations of the toil, although they're serving out their days in the police. So there's pressure coming from James Craig and others, unionists who are sure-footed in the poor corridors of power. Remember, the Lloyd George Bono Law election manifesto of 1918 had guaranteed partition for six counties. 
So that wasn't even in doubt at that stage, unless Sinn Féin managed to overturn it. The result is that Craig is able, he's sure-footed in the corridors of power. He and his colleagues are able to shape the settlement in these years. And Craig is determined that a separate entity will be set up in the northeast corner of Ireland with a police force that he can rely on. They become the ex-soldiers of the Ulster Specials, 30,000 strong by 1922, recruited in the Orange Halls, recruited um, in the estates of friendly landowners. Um, on the other hand, of course, the RIC are taking a more and more of a background role. Many of them are resigning under pressure from the IRA campaign. Um, um, and in some cases, they're retiring because of what they see as patriotic motives. There's a conflict between their view of their identity and what's happening. So all of that's going on. Why does the violent erupt suddenly in Belfast in 1920? Well, of course, the political uncertainty. The fu Ireland's future is uncertain. The IRA campaign has got De Valera's in America, seeking American presidential support for the Republic. Um, and, of course, a PR has been introduced for Irish elections in 1920. It's seen as a minority safeguard north and south. That means that the Nationalist wing, Derry Corporation, for Man and Tyrone County Councils, they do well in Belfast. For the first time, you have five Sinn Féin members of Belfast Corporation, as well as the five Nationalists. So there's a sense that Sinn Féin are kind of uh, succeeding even in the north, under PR. And of course, this causes a problem. How can Craig demand a six-county area excluded from Irish nationalism if two counties and a major city are uh, sort of uh, flying the nationalist flag? This is a real issue. So sectarian violence breaks out in Derry in May 1920. And uh, it very much involves the UVF, who are returning from the war, well armed by the Larn guns of 1914, and of course the IRA, which is emerging, uh, reinforced from Donegal. Derry is, of course, the entrepot for Donegal. It's a key uh, railway centre, industrial centre. Its population, um, as one unionist historian put it, are really composed of the landless labourer from the wilds of Donegal. The idea of separating Derry from Donegal seems unthinkable, yeah. and madness in economic terms at that stage. So there's a battle royal for control in Derry. Derry gets its first nationalist mayor, uh, in first Catholic mayor in 300 years, its first nationalist mayor ever, Hugh O'Doherty. His first speech is a condemnation of partition, saying they'll never be separated from their hinterland in Donegal. Unionism is becoming very, very alarmed at these democratic upsurges west of the ban. So, sectarian violence breaks out. Eventually, the IRA seem to be getting the upper hand, and only then are troops sent in from Dublin Castle. Something like 40 people that we know about are killed in that violence. It's pretty vicious. I mean, the wake houses of people killed in the Troubles are targeted by loyalist gunmen, and people are murdered leaving these houses. Yeah. And that causes a response. Members of the apprentice boards are stopped on the outskirts of the city and shot dead. Belfast is still quiet, but Belfast is on tenterhooks. It's a period when, if you remember back to the early 70s, people would have said to you in the city centre in Belfast, you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. That's what it's like. And then a number of things happen in that sort of June, early July, 1920. There are 3,000 Catholics working in the shipyards, the highest number there have ever been, out of about 20,000. They're still a small minority. Many of them are ex-soldiers from the Falls and Ardoin returned from the war. There are actually, I mean, something like, I think, 100 people with the Mons Medal and the Military <coughs> Medal from the trenches of Europe, from a nationalist background, because Redmond's call was to support uh, England's war effort and gain home rule. Um, Carson comes north and he makes a speech at the field, which was um, then actually in the outskirts of West Belfast, was now Finney Road North. And he says in a very, very insightful speech, a very provocative speech. We will tolerate no Sinn Féin in Ulster. And I'll call out the UVF. Now this is seen to, by many of the loyalist rank and file as a call to arms almost. At the same time, the IRA campaign is escalating in the south and a northern-born RIC um, commander, a Lieutenant Colonel G.B. Smith from Banbridge, is shot dead in Cork by the IRA and his body is brought home. There's an upsurge of sectarian violence in Banbridge to mark his funeral. Um, and of course, you have the background of the violence in Derry. What we know is, everything comes to a head when the shipyard holiday ends on the 23rd of July, 1916. There've also been sinister letters in the Unionist press talking about 
nationalist infiltration mm. into Belfast and Ulster. Very, very sinister. And by this stage, of course, tensions are rising. The shipyards reopen for work. People from nationalist West Belfast go to their jobs as usual. But meetings are being held at corners of the shipyard. Orators have come from Derry and from Bangor, loyalist orators. And there's a call to put all the Sinn Féiners out of the shipyard. Sinn Féin means any yeah, form of course, of yeah, yeah, background. Yeah. By that it's a broad brush. People have been driven out. <coughs> Just to give you an example, I mean a family example. My grandfather, from Nationalist East Belfast, um, served in the First World War. Royal Irish Fusiliers. He was wounded three times from the Dardanelles to the Western Front. He's demobbed in Dublin in 1919. And his commanding officer gives him a letter uh, to ensure that he will get light work. Soldiers who were wounded matter what their background in Ireland, wore sort of light blue overalls. That marked them out as disabled soldiers who deserved light work in the post-war surge of industry before the slump. And he got a job in the, in the rope works. And uh, he's only in to work a couple of weeks when he reaches the 23rd of July 1920. Uh, and he's driven out of his work with many others. They've been driven out of the shipyard, the engineering firms, Mackies, you name it. It's spreading up down the Lagan Valley, the Ban Valley. Soon you have nearly 10,000 Catholics thrown out of work because of their religion, but this masked as because they were Republicans, because they upheld Sinn Féin's um, advoca advocacy of violence. That's the view. My grandfather, a mob gets round him on the Newton Arts Road, and he's literally been kicked to death at the corner of D Street. And to her eternal credit, an old lady emerges from a house in D Street, from the Protestant community, and she throws her shawl over him, they wore shawls in those days. Yes, of course. And she says, this young man, he's only a boy really, he's only 20, fought for his country. You didn't. She saved his life. So that's the intensity of that violence. By, of course, evening, as the trams are carrying the shipyard workers, as they did religiously, back to the Shunkel and North Belfast, the trams are attacked in Crummick Square, um, in... Uh, York Street in the Nationalist enclaves as they go through and soon violence erupts and within four days 18 people are killed and what the papers call a carnival of terrorism. Now of course the first victim is an innocent woman and this says so much about the civilians um, who were killed during this period. Maggie Node from the Short Strand is crossing the bridge with a friend. She's a young woman of 23. She has her little girl of about five by the hand. Her mother's even in the markets in Bond Street. She has to get over the Albert Bridge and she comes across that first day's evening's rioting. The police are there, there's rioting, there's some burning debris. She's coming across the bridge on an errand of mercy and suddenly a shot rings out and she says to her friend, oh Mary, I'm, I'm, I'm shot, take the child. It turns out a policeman gives evidence at her inquest that he had fired the shot. Negligently, he said, a sergeant in the police had fired the shot. He said he was in the right situation, which killed this poor young woman. She was the first victim of 450 people who died. We just quote you the evidence of Robert McElborough. He was a lamplighter whose job was to light the lamps along the Utenars Road, both sides, yeah. the loyalist side, the nationalist side at that time. He said the people religiously told him, Mr. McElborough, we respect your job, but as soon as you light the, the lights, we will break the mantles because you're illuminating the area for gunmen. For snipers. And he said, of course, that the snipers were on the roofs, um, on both sides, but predominantly, it seems, on the Union side, sweeping the streets. And McElborough writes in his autobiography of a working man, which is a testament to that period, they swept the streets with their rifles, sparing neither man, woman, or child, and they checked the papers the next day to make sure they got the right people or people from the right community. Mm -hmm. So it was a, this were streets of fear. People shot at their own door, women with babies in their hands, women going to the shop. It was a horrendous period in the history of this city. Can, can I ask you a number of things that come out of that? And I have to say, I, I'm a great follower of your column in the Irish News when you deal with this and talk about it extensively. You mentioned that great volume of people who had fought for the British Empire during the Great War or the First World War. So they come back into Belfast and, and if they're fortunate they get work. Was there, was there any sense that that was a redeeming factor for nationalists who had served within the British Army? Did it make any difference that you had served Empire? 
Well, there are two aspects to it. In the South, people like that found themselves shunned by their own nationalist community. Yeah. They were wearing a British uniform, and now the British Army was represented by the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. That didn't stop many of them, like General Tom Barry, becoming IRA officers. Of Similarly in Belfast. I mean, a significant number of ex-World War I soldiers uh, gave their military skills to the IRA in that period. You know, so there was no sort of general exclusion of these people, but it didn't win them any kudos with the leaders of unionism. That was the problem. The Irish News has actually um, an editorial around this time reflecting on the march past of the remnants of Carson's army. You know, the men who had had their blood sacrifice at the Battle of the Somme, marching by the City Hall, not in the sort of pomp and glory of 1915 as they were going off to the Western Front. It's a much more depleted regiment, of course, comes back, mm. given the casualties of yeah, the Somme. Yeah. But nonetheless, the Irish News comments that as those men are celebrating their role in the Great War and remembering, as they should have done, fallen comrades, the nationalist veterans are queuing up at St Mary's Hall in Bank Street to get their allowance from charity from America to Liverpool for the expelled workers because they've been driven from their work. And they're kind of the nationalist um, veterans of the Great War, um, in Ireland generally, of course, but particularly in the North, are airbrushed out of history. Their contribution is forgotten. People could have been forgiven by the 1960s in believing that only, only Unionists and Protestants had fought in British Army uniform mm. in the Great War. Redmond's exhortation, Joe Devlin's ex exhortation here on the Falls Road to go over the fire in that extent, that was really forgotten. There was a little, a sad war memorial in St. Malachy's Chapel in Alfred Street to the men from the markets who died in the First World War. It was on the war in my it was on the wall in my childhood. It disappeared after Bloody Sunday in a refurb ten years ago. It was rediscovered and it's now in a discreet place. But it does make that link yeah, of that course. those nationalists that have been uh, whose history has been explored recently um, uh, by the Connacht Rangers project. That thousand to fifteen hundred Belfast Catholics who joined Redmond's army to fight, as they thought, of course, for yeah, Ireland yeah, that was and the, the freedom of... Yeah. They fought for Ireland. People understood that, even though attitudes were changing. And we have to remember that nationalist Belfast was overwhelmingly moderate in its nationalism. This was Joe Devlin's um, stronghold in West Belfast. He defeated Eamon de Valera here in 1918 by two to one, when the rest of nationalist opinion in the South was turning to Sinn Féin. Sweeping Devlin on. Yeah. walked on water here because he had fought for the mill girls and the unemployed. And, uh, you know, that stood him in good stead in these years. But he's still admired by Republicans for one reason. During these years, Devlin took a seat at Westminster. He's one of the few nationalists there. And he was really embarrassing the British government over its policy of militarisation in Ireland, over coercion and reprisals and what he calls the arming of pogromists, the raising of the B-specials and shocking events like the McMahon murders. If Devlin hadn't been there, um, the British government would have got away with a lot more during that period in Ireland. But Devlin supporters, particularly in the ancient order of Hibernians, they were strong in West Belfast. Corner of Clonard Street is still there, Clonard AOH. I mean, Joe Devlin's supporters were certainly perhaps 60% in West Belfast. And they, in, in fact, in clashed with the local IRA. In fact, during the 1918 election, things were very violent. I yeah. mean, <laughs> there's a great story told. I don't know if I have time to tell my kind of stories here, Joe, but I mean, uh, during the 1918 election, I have this from the former Judge Turlock O'Donnell, who mm. lived all his life on the Falls Road. Road. Yeah, yeah. But his father was on a Sinn Féin platform. He told me this at a school reunion 10 years ago, the late Judge O'Donnell. Um, his father was on a Sinn Féin platform in Clonard Street with Sean McEntee, the only Belfast man sentenced to death in the Easter Rising. And they were in a small crowd, you know, Sinn Féin wasn't as popular as the Hibernians and the Redmondites. And uh, they were supporting the Republic in 1918. And they heard this rising cacophony of sound, like female voices coming from somewhere close by. And in the garden of Clonard Monastery, there were something like a thousand mill girls gathered. Supporters of Wee Joe. They would sing their hearts out for Wee Joe. And suddenly the gates flew open. And this band of Harridans descended on the Sinn Féin platform. And the members had to run for their lives. And Judge O'Donnell told me, his father told him, that they were running down the Falls Road, a mile or so down to McEntee's Bar on King Street, Sean McEntee's father's pub for shelter. Yeah. And when they got in, 
they said, Sean McEntee was minus his britches. <laughs> Literally lost his treasure. <laughs> Can I ask you, which has always fascinated me, Civic Rosati, for instance, the, the Catholic Church, uh, I think it was Cardinal McCrory, was it? It was Bishop McCrory. Bishop McCrory. Uh, did they speak out? Were they, were they vocal in terms of the Fenton, what would be seen as their flock? And if they were, were they listened to? And the whole of Ireland, because of the Catholic hierarchy, were again walking a tightrope initially, condemning the violence of the IRA and condemning the violence of the security forces, the crime forces. And by 1920, of course, after Bloody Sunday and events like that, shocking reprisals taken against the civilian population, often priests murdered by the And these were organised, these were sanctioned, organized, by, the organized, British sanctioned by the British cabinet, sanctioned yeah. by Lloyd George Churchill and the rest. Churchill said, you know, they should justify this because it would alienate the nationalist population they hoped from the IRA campaign. And of course, therefore, you have the uh, the burning of Balbriggan, you know, uh, the murder of civilians there in 1920 following an IRA attack on the police, the burning of Cork City, the civilian deaths of Bloody Sunday, and the series of reprisal killings by the police in Belfast following IRA shootings. You know, you have that during the time. So the Catholic Church finds itself more and more bereft of words of condemnation from the IRA because they are so embroiled in condemning the forces of the Crown and they're supported not just by Joe Devlin, but by Herbert Asquith, the former Prime Minister, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, by liberals, by the Labour and Liberal press, who are condemning, really, a British policy of reprisals in Ireland. I mean, Britain's name is being disgraced internationally by 1921 as the reprisals continue and the black and tans and specials are clearly out of control mm. you know, across, across Ireland. So that's really happening at the time. One of the other things that we could touch on briefly, because I think some of these things are, are, are they're, they're either lost in history or they're not, they're not taught. Uh, and it was a piece that I read that you had mentioned, Collins at one stage had actually sanctioned the burning of Belfast. Talk, tell me about that. Yeah, the IRA of course in Belfast grows through about 1,200 strong in Belfast, Antrim and the northern part of County Down, down as far as about Castle Wellen. The IRA strength grows, but initially it's just a few hundred people. And of course, as in the case across Ireland, you know, uh, most of these people are from, if they're from rural areas, they're from a small farming background or they have jobs as clerks or electricians. You know, they're fairly well set up individuals. There may be people from the very poor classes, but not many. Um, it has been said that subsistence farming and subsistence jobs produced very few guerrillas. Their leaders are also very young. I mean, you find, I mean, John McKelvey's in his yeah, early course, 20s, yeah. Seamus Woods in his early 20s. Um, these are the people who are active. Just think about who they were. You have Joe McKelvey, who was a clerk in Mackey's, the son of an RIC man. Yeah. Not an uncommon background for IRA members. Um, you have Seamus Woods from Ballyhorn in County Down, the son of small farmers, um, who was training to be an accountant in his early 20s in the city centre. You have Roger McCarley from Toombridge, family moved into the city, um, and others. They they are kind of the, the the main kind of activists for the IRA. The main gunmen. Doctor McNabb from North well, Belfast. The most you've got people, of course, as yeah. well, who are obviously from a different from the Antrim Road. You've Doctor McNabb, who mm -hmm. stood as a Sinn Fein candidate in 1918, and who, of course, becomes involved in ferrying ex UVF ammunition from 1914 it's an story. to Dublin twice a week in his car. And he's invaluable to Michael Collins. Now, McNabb, is, he's also the medical officer to the Belfast IRA. He's a practice in Donegal Street until it's shot up by the specials in 1922. But when he's less well known by the authorities, he's driving up and down with a boat full of, of ammunition uh, to fuel the flying columns of Cork and Tipperary, invaluable to Michael Collins. You've got McNabb, very, very key figure, and after the treaty is signed, most of these people now become members of the National Army. They take the pro-treaty yeah. pro side, not because they supported partition, but because after the treaty was signed, they had no option. Collins offered them arms, um, military support, and political support in the very dire situation they were in in Belfast, a totally unionist city with thousands of police and specials and the British Army ranged against them. So, I mean, they support Collins, as the French might say, faux de mur, for want of a better policy. Yeah. Collins, I mean, one of the first things happens is when the treaty is signed, 
there's a, a very sad photograph, I think, of Joe McKelvey and others, some of them wearing IRA uniforms in Cavendish Square. Yeah. Where well, they come onto the street and think, you know, the treaty side, we have won. We must have won because the first line was, Ireland shall be the Irish Free State. But if they read into the depth, of course, the North is able to opt out under Clause um, uh, 12 and a boundary commission will be set up. And this causes confusion over Christmas. Bishop McCrory, of course, one of the great defenders of the Belfast nationalist population, during the sectarian violence, he talks openly about pogroms against his flock. Um, he writes to Lord George, he writes to the British government, uh, he attends the funerals of riot victims, including IRA volunteers during this period. Um, but nonetheless, on that Christmas after the treaty is signed, when Ireland is beginning to contemplate, some are saying this is a new deal, it will end the violence and give us a stepping stone, as Collins argued, to full independence. Joe McKelvey and another veteran Republican from Belfast, Dennis McCullough, yeah. who had been involved in the mobilisation of 1916, a, f a fellow IRB man, I'm not sure that Joe McKelvey was in the IRB, but McCullough had been in jail in, in Wales with Collins and was in that secret group, the IRB. They meet Collins at midnight at the Gresham Hotel on uh, Christmas Day 1921. And they say, look, we've had many meetings among the officers of the 3rd Northern Division in Belfast. We're not sure what to do. And where are we and going? A lot will depend on what you tell us. Where do we fit into all this? A treaty which some say is for 26 counties and that Craig will be secure in his territorial area under uh, a unionist government and a unionist police force. And Collins gives them assurances they're looking for um, access to arms, access to support from the South, guarantees of political support. And Collins says these aren't unreasonable. And he agrees to a number of things. He sets up a 70-man force in West and North Belfast of IRA men, specially handpicked, called the Belfast City Guard. And they're to protect the nationalist areas uh, from attack by loyalists, but also, of course, from um, RIC and B Special murder squads at that time. Collins also agrees to several campaigns of violence in the North. He's really in breach of the treaty in which he is signed in the spring of 1922. And also he's planning an all Northern offensive in May, involving every division which has territory in the six counties. That includes Frank Aiken's 4th Northern based in Dundalk in South Armagh, she Seamus Woods is then OC, the 3rd Northern in Belfast, South um, um, Down and County Antrim, and uh, divisions west of the ban as far as Donegal. The idea is that they will mob be mobilised uh, in May 1922. The signal will be an attack on Musgrave Street Police Headquarters. Um, uh, that old, I went to school in the shadow of an Oxford Street CBS. I remember the old five-storey Victorian yeah. barracks. And what I didn't realise was that Seamus Woods and his colleagues, 21 men of the 3rd Northern Battalion, um, used... Uh, Oxford Street CBS school as their, their base when they were about to enter the barracks that night, donning RIC You know, They got right into the arms room, were hoping to fill armoured cars with guns when they were foiled by a Sergeant Toomey. Shots were fired, um, an RIC man was shot dead, they all escaped <laughs> from it. But, it was a, but that was to be the signal for a, a northern campaign. People talked about it, a northern uh, insurrection against all that had been achieved under partition. Now Collins, or, or, or O'Duffy, or Mulcahy, or all three, called that off at the last minute. Word reached South Armagh, it didn't reach Belfast. And the Belfast Antrim and Down campaign went ahead. And Woods complained afterwards, of course, that their areas were flooded by B-specials. Yeah. And, the young, and the, the, many of the young volunteers involved had to be sent across the sea to Scotland in small boats from Red Bay. Uh, to get back to Dublin by a long route. So the whole thing miscarried. And a, a senior official advising Collins wrote after his death, you know. Collins had two policies, he said. He had a political policy in line with the treaty, which he was trying to sell to the British government. But he had this kind of uh, shadowy, clandestine policy of supporting the Northern IRA. And he was a born conspirator. So Collins, you know, maintained these old friendships. And of course, until the end, was talking to former comrades on the other side of the Civil War split with a view to, uh, if you like, ending the Civil War. So we don't know what policy Collins, had he lived, would have pursued on the North, but he was certainly very concerned about what was happening in Belfast.
When does, when does the political situation, if stability is a, an operative word, and it's a dangerous word in Irish politics, but, but when do you do we start to see the, the levelling out, so the curfew's been lifted, the the police been reined in, the, 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 the kind of seminence of normality, when does that begin to happen? Well, of course, um, it's not really until the summer of 1922 when the Civil War breaks out in the South, and the South is divided, that the Southern focus goes off the North completely. The seven or 800 uh, IRA, IRA men from the South are brought down to the Curra for further training. But really, after Collins's death, that's a code word for becoming involved in crushing the Republican side in the Civil War. All these Northern IRA men, like Seamus Woods, like Roger McCorley, they become very, very much officers in the Free State Army in that period. Some of them make their careers in the Free State yeah, Army. They find themselves leading um, pro-treaty troops in places like Kerry and Tipperary against those who are upholding the Republican cause. Now, many of them are not very happy with this, uh, but they can't return to their homes because of the political situation here. By May 1922, the Special Powers Act has been passed, internment has been introduced, uh, and there are something like 700 internees that summer on the Argenta prison ship in Belfast Lock. Many of them were Collins' supporters of the IRA. Many of them were Sinn Féin activists, councillors, mayors of cities, um, you know, businessmen who find themselves under lock and key. And there's a brain drain from the North. Those leading Republicans who had been elected, like Sean McEntee, like Ernest Blythe, um, uh, find themselves, and ordinary people who had been involved in the IRA come on the Mon, they drift south because obviously they are going to be sought by the hue and cry if they stay where they are. Yeah. And they find new careers in southern politics. In the case of McEntee, he becomes Tom Estia, uh, in the Doyle. Um, you find others uh, like Michael Carolyn, a Sinn Féin councillor and IRA leader from Ardoin, who becomes heavily involved in the anti-treaty IRA. Others become members of the new Guardi, the civil service, um, and many ways. And, you know, they're confused by the situation because when it finally settles down and the free state emerges and the jails open, most of the Republicans leave Ireland forever. They're not prepared to live in a free state because they fought for a republic. And many of the Northerners who are now part of the free state system, yeah. I heard one story about a young woman from the Glens of Antrim, Siobhan Nyluan, who was a poetess, wrote lovely poetry. She'd been involved in Common the Man, and her family told me she never really came home again. She was so embarrassed that partition had emerged, that that shining vision of uh, a united Gaelic Irish Republic had been lost in the Civil War. So it's really with the Civil War that, if you like, that obviously Republican violence in Belfast and other areas of the North finally comes to an end. And by the end of that summer, curfew is still in vogue. But there's a policy picked up on by Seamus Woods, the IRA OC in Belfast. He winds up the operation here in October 1922. There's a letter to Richard Mulcahy saying that he has closed GHQ. He's very sad about this as a Republican because he said, I think that um, creating an Ulster and Gaelic lines will now be lost for a long time to come. So really that's the end of militant republicanism in Belfast uh, as, he, as, he, as he seals that up. And also of course the free state as it emerges after Collins' death is more concerned with, uh, if you like, consolidating the 26 county state <coughs> than looking north. Their only northern policy is the Boundary Commission. So northern nationals are told to boycott the Northern Ireland Parliament until the Boundary Commission reports. Um, remember, there had been cooperation between Devlin and Sinn Féin in the 1921 partition elections. Um, they agreed to a pact, which meant that they would both both parties would boycott the partition parliament in Belfast. In fact, Joe Devlin described partition in very, very um, kind of extreme language for the time. Partition means national suicide. The suicide was a crime in 1921. It's not anymore. So, you know, it was something very serious. But the problem was on the ground, across the north, in Belfast and rural Ulster, there was bad feeling between the Hibernian rank and file, the Autodot Redmondites, 
um, who were still carrying the Home Rule flag with a harp. And the Republicans, uh, those who had taken the Republican side, had had the tricolour. And therefore, they didn't really gel at grassroots level. Seats were lost in 1921. And didn't trust each other either. Well, yeah. they didn't trust each other. Yeah. I mean, some Republicans blamed the Hibernians for informing in the police. Um, uh, some Hibernians were quite militant and formed the Hibernian Rifles and actually joined forces with the IRA during this period. But if you think about it, Woods talks about a policy of fraternisation. As the Civil War breaks out in the South and the IRA leave the scene, as it were, leave the stage, as a phrase we use a lot today, the police are moving into blockhouses on the Falls Road. They take over the Beehive, for example. Um, and uh, they're fraternising very much with the population. And they're using well-known members of the RIC, usually Southern Catholics, who are saying to the local parish priest, you know, the bad days are over. We are just ordinary bobbies on the beat. We want to get back to normal policing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I mean, if you tell this to your flocks, and there's a sort of a, uh, an accommodation has been created, kind of a modus vivendi between the two sides. As in the South, after the truce, people are so glad on the ground in nationalist and unionist areas to have a bit of light at the end of the tunnel after, you know, three, four years of continuous violence when you weren't safe to let your children on the streets. We think of atrocities like the killing of the little girls on the lamppost swinging on a, yeah. uh, on, on a moonlit evening in February 1922 at Weaver Street, yeah. now covered by the M2 in North Belfast. Six of them killed, others brutally mutilated by loyalist bombs. Nobody wanted to go back to that. But what you find is, of course, because republicanism leaves the scene, those who were in Sinn Féin either go south. Um, Dr. McNabb is a rare example of somebody who comes back to the north in the mid-twenties and he's kind of left alone. His own family weren't even involved of his dark secrets, you know. Um, and I've, Cahar Healy, who's a Sinn Féin leader in, in Fermanagh, he finds himself in the mid-twenties cooperating with Joe Devlin to try to create an opposition uh, in the new northern parliament, you know. Um, but many have gone south. Uh, and they've sought careers and made the best that they could. We can read their witness statements today, you know, but there was a sense of that they had been let down. Can I ask you the last question, which is always the most unfair question, because it means you have no redress. And we've been speaking for an hour. Could things, could they have been done, could they have changed, could they have been done different, could they have been done better? Or was what we've seen in 2021 and 22 the inevitability of this, these two fundamentally opposed yeah. political forces? I think we have to be honest in the backward glance of history and looking back. If we even go back to Joe Devlin and John Redmond's nationalism, which was strong between kind of the 1880s and Parnell and the Home Rule Act becoming law in 1914, nationalism had never really tried to engage those people of a unionist background. Despite the 1798 background, when you did have a movement, not universal, but certainly in Eastern Ulster and in Belfast, to unite Catholic, Protestant and dissenter around egalitarian ideals of the French Revolution, um, had that been revisited in the 19th century? Had that liberal Presbyterianism been harnessed to a nationalist movement? But Daniel O'Connell's nationalism, although he was, I mean, not a bigot himself, but he based it on the Catholic Church. So you had this identity where to be a Catholic was to be a nationalist and vice versa. They were always Protestant nationalists, but they were a small minority. Republicanism didn't ask people its religion when it was recalibrating uh, in the early 20th century with the Dungannon Club and the birth of the IRB. You had people like Ernest Blythe, you had people like Sean Lester, people like Bulmer Hobson, working with McCullough, Sean McDermott and others. But again, it was too late. You know, that the 19th century was lost and Henry Cook had managed to unite the various Protestant sects uh, into a kind of a proto-unionism by mm. the 1830s mm. at the great Hillsborough meeting. Cook's message was, you must unite together against popery, nationalism and liberalism. And that defined unionism moving And forward. it was simple. So when we get to 1912-14, <coughs> nationalism had never really considered that Ulster unionism might block the way. And of course, we always have a tendency in Ireland, down to the 1970s and all the anti-partition campaigns of the post-war years, that all you need to do is get 
you know, 50% plus one and the problem solved. But having come through hell and high water and the tragedies of the 30 years of violence, I mean, we now know it's not as simple as that, that you have to take people's fears into account, whether they're nationalist or unionist. Now, did it have to work out the way it did? It did and it didn't. It would be very hard to avoid some kind of exclusion or partition in those years. But remember, if Redmond and Devlin had played it differently, the area of exclusion, the area of what became Northern Ireland would have been different. I mean, yeah. Redmond, Bonner Law said in 1914 privately to Carson, we can't demand any more than four counties. And then Asquith offered Redmond Derry with a plebiscite and Urie with a plebiscite. That was three and a half counties. Yeah. So there was always a sense on the nationalist side that if they could make home rule work, and it was seen to be working in a fair way, in those other 28 and a half counties, then the others might eventually come in. If they had got home rule in 1914 for 28 counties, there would have been a very soft line on the map because nobody was talking about a storm of parliament. You know, you would have still have had an all-Ireland police force. You would have had an all-Ireland institutions. It would be like moving from, um, you know, Carlisle into Scotland today. There's no border. But we got to a situation then where as a result of the Irish Revolution, of course, we were not just talking about home rule, we were talking about an independent Irish yeah. street, but yeah. we still hadn't overcome unionist resistance. So we could have affected the geography. In one way, though, the British government could have affected the outcome. Um, if the British government had, as Joe Devlin demanded, introduced safeguards for the Northern Nationalists in the 1920 Act, Joe Devlin demanded PR, he demanded fair electoral system, he demanded you know, that the Senate, each Irish Parliament was being offered a Senate under the 1920 Government of Ireland Act. If the Northern Senate, which ended up at Stormont, had been weighted in favour of the Nationalists, or as in the South, if the Nationalists had been given 50% of the seats, OK, you're a third of the population, there's 50% of the seats, so that you can scrutinise le scrutinize legislation on fair employment, on education, on law and order, to make sure that you're happy with it. That's what Carson obtained for the Southern Unionists, 10% in the South. But the Nationalists didn't get that. Their demands for safeguards, uh, introduced by people like Devlin, supported by Liberals and the handful of Labour MPs, were all voted down serially by the Unionists. So the civil rights campaign of the 60s and all the grievances around it, all of that was actually being created in 1922, yeah, when yeah. the state was set up. Unionism, uh, really, as someone said, OK, the Nationalists abstained from the, uh, the new Northern Parliament in 1921. Devlin took a seat in 25, but the main Nationalist body didn't take their seats in 1927. But there was, there was no duty of care for the Nationalists, when the Unionists were bringing in their special powers act, abolishing PR, gerrymandering constituencies. If there had been an, a tendency, you know, that they, they really took no account of the Nationalists, you know? Nationalist demands from people like Devlin for safeguards were treated more or less with contempt. The only act ever passed in this period was the Wild Birds Protection Act of 1932. So, in many ways we're talking about partition would not have been easily avoided. There's another scenario. In 1907, the new Liberal government with a massive majority offered Redmond a, a, an Irish council for the whole of Ireland. It wasn't home rule. He said, look, we can, really can't get you home rule at the moment. But we'll give you an all-Ireland body where unionists and nationalists will sit in the same room in Dublin and they will have control of some departments, say education, you can have local government, and then with confidence we'll give you more. Cahar Healy, who was an IRA intelligence officer in Fermanagh, who was a Sinn Féin politician and ended up um, the father of the house at Stormont. He said in his old age, this Sinn Féiner, this Gaelic leaguer from County Fermanagh, he said, you know, if we got that Irish Council and set it up, it, wa it wasn't a republic, but it was for all Ireland and it could have evolved. So there were other possibilities, Joe, in this period. I said when I began a long time ago that the, the purpose of these discussions is to motivate, educate and stimulate, I suppose, in that order. Your talk has been fabulous, I have to say, it's been, been very informative. And on behalf of the Commemoration Centenary Committee, I, I'd like to, to thank you. Um, hopefully out of all these discussions, what we get is people develop an, an informed opinion, not something that they, they got into their head. <laughs>
an informed opinion. And history is a fascinating subject, as you know better than most of us. And sometimes it's also a way of not repeating the same mistakes. So, Eamon, thank you very much. This has been thank a you very much indeed, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you.